All right, so we are here with JP Bouvet uh, for the second time in Leeds, and I want to thank you loads for coming back. Uh, it's been great to have you here for the last two days. It's always so, fun to come. Leeds Drum Academy. Cool, man. To hang out with Joe. Come back. I will. That's that's the first. Yeah. It's not even. It's the question. first rule it's of coming to Leeds Drum Academy is you have to come back. Uh, I want this this conversation to be more of a, a way of inspiring up-and-coming drummers because you know you're a young guy and there's a lot of people out there that really look up to you because of that factor mm -hmm. um, so yeah I wanted to ask you how did it start you know how where did you start playing the drums assuming it was in Minnesota but yeah yeah I grew up in Minnesota in the suburbs very suburban like textbook suburbia um, but a great place to grow up. I mean, we had outdoors, we had things, I played sports, you know, regular public school. And I don't think I was, I was not, I, I guess the, the most, the inspirational part to take from any of, of my upbringing is that it's pretty unspectacular. You know, I was a normal kid. I did not start playing when I was two, you know, I started when I was nine. And I was not a child prodigy. I thought I was good, but I was also the only drummer in... Lakeville yeah, so helps. yeah I had I had like one musician friend who I made in high school or, or no I, I had one musician friend I grew up with and then one other one that went to my high school so there were not a lot of music mm -hmm. kids around the high school didn't really have much of a music program it was like your average public school situation um, but yeah I just loved it and I practiced and and for me what what thinking back what I realized was kind of key in in like my development early on was that I found one friend early who played guitar right. and we started a band when I was probably 12 and that person is Mike Linden who's one of my best friends today and uh, I was at Sh this place called Schmidt Music taking drum a 30 minute drum lesson every week and it's no Leeds Drum Academy believe me but I would go hang out with Wade, I had a great teacher. And there was a bulletin board and it said drummer and bassist wanted. So I pulled it and I called the guy and it was Mike. And that was the big, that was hugely important in my life because we played in that band for five years. We started a different band after that. We started getting into jazz fusion. First band was like a progressive rock thing. He went to Berkeley the year before me. He's the reason I knew about Berkeley. So I went there, we roomed together, we lived together after that. I was the best man at his wedding last year. So like, he's like the closest thing I have to a brother. Right, and it all came from just like, and, and really the, the thing to take from that is like, you gotta start. Don't be afraid to look. Don't be afraid to take chances. Be uncomfortable. Pull that little bulletin board thing off and actually call the guy. Yeah, because it could lead to nothing. Sure, you know, nine times out of ten, I mean, not every person you meet is gonna lead to like some everlasting friendship and career move, but you never know, you know. So, yeah. so that was a huge turning point for me, and I don't know if I would have been as excited about drums as early if I didn't have my pal to like be in the band with, write music with, and so on. That's definitely something we can all relate to, I hope yeah. anyway, because, you know, I, I started exactly the same way. I started playing drums because it was, uh, I come from a very small town outside of Lisbon, yeah. and um, it was almost necessary that someone played the drums. <laughs> um, and it just so happened to be me who were like, sure, I'll play the drums. And I started taking drum lessons and joined the band, and. Yes. Yada 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 yada, and, and yeah. so we went, and passion came later, you know, like yeah, I yeah. just played drums because you know they needed a drummer. <laughs> yeah, totally. And early on, people were like, "Did you, did you like practice all day every day? Like, how did you, like when you first started, how did you act?" And I was like, "I was a normal kid. I was like nine. I was like, you can only be so serious about something like that. Yeah. At nine, you know. I played other sports, hung out with my friends. I played drums. I really liked it. You know, it's just like I liked doing it." And that was the main reason that I practiced some. I, I totally went through years in my early, where I hardly played. But it's like, there were also years where I was like really into it, you know? Yeah. And yeah, I got more and more serious as I went until I kind of dropped the other sports and just went with music. No, that's cool. And uh, yeah, like I said, I think it's a very familiar experience. Yeah, because the biggest problem that I hear, one of the biggest things I hear is there's no other musicians in my town, which is totally a legit problem. So try to find the one dude, you yeah. know, if you, if you, if you grew up in a smaller town, you're not going to have like a massive scene of nope. like all these musicians, maybe you will, but probably not. Um, but finally your one pal from a different city, mine didn't live in the same city as me, 
Um, and just like that's really helpful. Not like absolutely key, but it's helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Good start. No, oh, thanks. Now the next point would be <laughs> Berkeley. Yeah, cool. And going to Berkeley, um, you know, you mentioned, I didn't know that, you mentioned that it was kind of a, of a outside influence, your, your yeah. friend went there, so you were like, well, sure, I want to go there as well, but we're talking about Berkeley, we don't, it's not like I want to go for swimming lessons as well, so <laughs> you don't just decide, or do you? <laughs> well, no, yeah, it wasn't that easy, it wasn't like, yeah. I want to go, and then I was signed up. Um, because yeah, this friend of mine, Mike, who I played on the album, he's the guy that wrote Mega Jumbo. There's some YouTube videos from his album on there, on, on YouTube. So he went a year before me, and he he was he's a different kind of breed than me. Where he started playing at six, he he wanted to go to Berkeley since he was like twelve. Right. And so that was cool. So I just knew about it through knowing him, mm -hmm. and he went there. And honestly, like, I and I find, I think people will find comfort in this too. Like, I'm I've never been, and I'm still I'm not like obsessed with drums like to a to a like a crazy extent right. like when I was thinking about college I really was thinking maybe not going to Berkeley I was I looked at architecture schools I looked at design graphic design schools I was like into other things like genuinely I, I really liked those things too so I was looking around I wasn't sure Berkeley was super expensive and my family is like we're like middle of the road so it was definitely not an easy thing right. for the family that was like a discussion that was ongoing was like financially you have a little sister that also needs to go to school this is like a big thing you know so and I got some scholarship but no matter what it's just a big expense so eventually my mom was like you should go she's a musician she understands she was like you should definitely go because if you don't you're gonna always ask what if you had gone you know mm -hmm. and bless her for that because it was going to moving to Boston was the first, I'd say in my whole life so far, was the biggest and most important positive change ever. How old were you? 18. 18. Yeah. And yeah, it was just like, I don't know, people are really afraid to leave home. People are really afraid to leave what's comfortable. And you learn so much when you, when you escape, a, escape a comfort zone. You know that, you've traveled all over. It's like... You just like, I would be, I went to Boston in this place where people came from all over the world to really commit to this music on the level that I was ready to commit to. So it's like for the first time, there were all these people that were like on the same mental place as me, you know, no longer hobbyists. Yeah. We're here to do this for real and we're paying a lot of money and we left our families behind to do it. So everyone takes it really seriously. And that's honestly the biggest difference between Berkeley and a lot of other schools is that Berkeley's in Boston and I actually still don't know a single person from Boston. Literally everyone that I ever met at school flew in from somewhere else, left home, left everything, all their friends, and restarted. Right. And that's really beautiful. You know, there's, yeah. that shows, already shows another level of commitment that's really important. And it was just cool. And it was like the kind of thing where you go back home and like it feels like nothing's changed. You're like, man, I feel like I grew so much. It's because you have to. You know, you, you just yeah. learn how to be alone and live alone and meet new people and do these things because you don't have a choice. And it was really cool. But, so yeah, that's how I got to the Berkeley area. And then once I was there, you just meet, the, the reason, because I get asked a lot from students one on one about Berkeley, and the reason that a place like that is valuable, I don't think everyone should go to Berkeley. Not, there are a lot of people that don't thrive there, don't like it, and they leave. But the reason that a place like that is really special is because you are plopped into this place and in a month you meet 200 people yeah. with a similar goal to yours mm -hmm. and if you, then it just naturally you just naturally align with the people who like have similar mindset and approach to music and like similar things and naturally it just like you start to form a little squad and you do things you know and it's really there's never another time in life where you are just plopped into hundreds, actually thousands of other people who want to do what you want to do. Because yeah. if you think about if I had, because I'm, I'm like not great at like walking into a bar and like making friends and leaving, you know? Me neither. Yeah. yeah. I've never been that guy. I wish I was, but I've never been that guy. So like if I had skipped a bo Boston and gone straight to like New York right. or LA or a city where I was like, I'm going to go do music, 
which some people can totally do. For me, that would have been extremely hard because if I was trying really hard, going to all the jams, going to all the things that you should be going to when you mm -hmm. are new in the scene, I might have met one person a week. And who knows if you actually like connect with those people, if they already have drummers for all their project, if they have, a, they don't, I don't know. It's like, there's so much chance involved in that. And it's just like, I don't know, like you're just basically given a network of people who are committed and are serious and are good. Yeah. That's the magic of Berkeley. The classes are cool, teachers are great. You like, you, you just experience a lot. For me, I, I talk a lot about being a doist and there are two phases of doism and phase one is like, <laughs> it's just like doing everything. It's like, uh, it's like reckless doing. You just go and you take every opportunity that comes. And in a place like that, there are so many. So it's like, okay, you start doing sessions. I don't know if I'm going to like that. Cool. Start doing singer-songwriter gigs. Start trying to play jazz gigs. Start do this. Book your own gigs. And you just start doing everything. And you just learn a lot fast. Yeah, the natural know? selection of what you want to do as a professional. Is just yeah, it, it to starts you. to happen. Yeah, because you try a lot of things. Yeah. That I wouldn't have been able to try had I not gone there. Um, and you start to learn fast, yeah. I thought I wanted to do this, and I don't. But I really like this aspect, you know? A lot of people end up exactly. in the music business, writing, production, playing. It's like, who knows? Yeah. So it was a valuable time for me. And I, I got, I've never gotten better at the drums faster than while I was there because the atmosphere is just very conducive to it. Yeah. I, would, I would just obsess, and any time I had nothing going on, I would be practicing. Yeah, I think that that uh, makes perfect sense. I mean, in an atmosphere where everyone obviously already wants to be the best, or else they wouldn't even choose yeah. Berkeley. Right. They would go to their local music school. Yeah. Um, you know, it just becomes like this contagious. Totally. Scene practices more in an healthy way. Yeah, and it's half healthy and it's half like competitive and scary. You're like, I need to yeah. get my act together here. Yeah. <laughs> Which is not bad. It's that's, yeah, it's good. Not necessarily yeah. bad because that's real life. <laughs> yeah, and there are enough people that you kind of find yourself somewhere in the middle of the pack. Or like mm. there are some crazy drummers, and then there are some people who I feel like I'm a little bit more advanced than. And so it's encouraging because you kind of yeah. see yourself in the timeline, which right. is cool. Yeah. And for everyone, that place exists in some form. That's why I'm saying it's not Berkeley for everyone. For some people, it's McNally Smith, MI, Valencia, Berkeley. It's, it could be anywhere. It could be a BIM in England. It could be anywhere um but the, the really the big lesson there is put yourself in the best place to succeed mm -hmm. because then you have less excuses and less people to blame by yourself yeah totally yeah no yeah. still uh, on the career subject mm -hmm. i think it was after that that you went on and um did the guitar center drum off it was did that you won i did and <laughs> My, my question is again like just career related is how did that help you not so much the the experience of the yeah. guitar syndrome off but the aftermath yeah yeah well the after the after is the really important part actually and that's the difficult part because when you're preparing for it, it it's like it, it is there's a lot of you're up against a lot but you know what you should be doing you should be trying to make a great solo yeah simple enough after that's where like it's funny because that is seen as an end point like sweet I won like now obviously my career is made and I'm gonna be rich but no <laughs> you have like two months of like people care a lot and like messaging you all the time and like a hundred friend requests in a day and then you just kind of like and it's like it never happened so it's like, there's this, it's like immediately afterward, I was like, okay, now this is the real challenge. Like this is the actual competition of life now. Like how do I make the most out of this experience? Yeah. <clears throat> and honestly, that's a huge part of being successful in whatever you're doing is seeing the opportunities to come and choosing whether or not you're gonna do them. And if you're gonna do them, do them as good as you can and just make the most of them, like the actual most, yeah. you know? So, it was hard, I mean, because if you think about it, like, millions of people, uh, well, the video has like a million and a half views or something, no, more than that, 
I don't know, but I'm lots of views. Um, but what's crazy is like one out of a thousand people is actually gonna like follow your career and care right. and be a, like yeah. a fan. Mm -hmm. So with that ratio, like coming out of the drum off, I was working hard to cultivate by at the end of the year, maybe like 50 fans, like people that actually care. Mm -hmm. And of those, there's an even smaller number who would actually pay for content from me or come to a drum camp or pay to come to a clinic or something like that. So there's this like, sure, millions of people have heard my name which just because someone heard your name doesn't mean they care you know that's like yeah. that's like the big networking myth is like here's my card no I'm set you know it's like so <laughs> not at all <laughs> so from there I don't know it was just like I was just doing again just doing everything I possibly could I was just like was there any kind of like game plan up, like that you already had well I knew I was gonna launch the website I right. actually had the idea of doing the website before the drum off and mm -hmm. the drum off was basically just like okay, now I should definitely, now is the time. Yeah. So I had already kind of started designing it and I redesigned it and it took a year, honestly, to design and have my friend program, but a year anniversary from the drum off is where I lost, launched it on the next year's drum off. Because the immediate goal had to be, I need to be something other than the guy that won the drum off by the time the next drum off comes. Because if you're only the guy that won the drum off, then you've been replaced, you know? Yeah. So... So yeah, it was, it was that, I did my first clinic tour, which Guitar Center set up. Mm -hmm. But then after that, it was all I was setting everything up. Uh, and that's another big myth is that like, even, even like not just me, but other drummers like, is that like, oh, like companies pay you to fly around the world and do clinics. It's like, no, not really. Like, especially in the first two years. It was literally, I booked everything, and most people didn't know who I was, and I did clinics yeah. in living rooms, and I did clinics at high schools. I just did everything I could possibly do. And it was very exciting, it was very fun, it was very rewarding, I learned a lot. And yeah, I just kind of became my own booking agent, and my own manager, and the own, like, I run the website by myself, and yeah, you just like, I don't know, you're not, you're not, <laughs> you're not a big deal yet. So there's no reason anyone should give you any handouts. So once you kind of realize that, have some sense of reality of like, I don't really deserve endorsements because I haven't actually done anything with my career mm -hmm. with like that has any longevity. So yeah, that's, that's, that was the goal after it's like, okay, now it's time to do stuff that isn't from the competition. Yeah. So the pushing the bands I'm in, the website, doing other sessions with people, random tours here and there. And yeah, just slowly building it up. Building it up. But you know? I think you said something that is important for a lot of people, and I know a lot of young drummers. And um, I might, I might, or might not, have been guilty of that. <laughs> Thinking that um, some certain events in your life mean success, right? Uh, endorsements, yeah, money. And I know a lot of young guys who who are not ready to to do the clinic in the living room. Right. They wouldn't. They, they haven't done anything yet. They already know that they wouldn't do that. Right. So they want to skip the step and like, yeah. I'm going to do something that's suddenly All you know, sudden, just send I'm me to the stratosphere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's... And they it, end up feeling frustrated because it never happens. Because you got to right. do that. Yeah. You got to pay your That time. happens to like 2%, 1% of people. Yeah. I mean, you know, you just can't count on sample. it. You can't count on it. <laughs> it's the kind of deal where like, if you look at pop stars and you're like, okay, there's Katy Perry, there's Lady Gaga, there's Britney Spears, there's all these people. I'm obviously from like the 90s, so. <laughs> there's Britney Spears and Justin Timberlake. So, and then you're like, okay, well, I have to do that if I'm going to be a successful musician. You know? But what, what you're totally overseeing is that that's 0.01% of musicians and the rest of them you've never heard of. Yeah. And they're fine, they're financially cool, they're loving their life, they're making great music, mm -hmm. you know? It's like, the average successful musician is not on billboard charts, you know what I mean? Yeah. Same in our little drum world. Like, there are a lot of really good, really successful drummers that aren't in drum magazines, that you've never heard of, that don't have YouTube channels, that yeah. just drum. They work. They work, <laughs> that's it, you know? Yeah. Like, it's such a small group that is the like that has that kind of 
ch- like modeled their career to want to be public, to want to teach, to want yeah. to yeah. be some sort of figure in a magazine or something. So that's an important thing to realize too is that like the ma- vast majority of, of successful musicians is not the people that you see on TV and on YouTube. Yeah. You know, which should be very um, encouraging because yeah. it's very You're possible. doing it. Yeah. You're doing it. Yeah. You just have to do it yourself, you know. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. No, but that, that's, a, that's a good point. I mean, if you go to, to play like, a place like Nashville, mm-hmm. there's a gazillion super yeah. accomplished drummers there. Then, who's that? Totally. Like, totally. you don't know, and they record 10 albums a day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, but that's a, that's a, that's an interesting thing, and I see that a lot when it comes to to you know younger drummers who are starting to aim like they they start planning and they plan ahead like uh, which is good, but then they skip the step. They I don't know. It might, might be uh, the way that we see success these days is yeah. uh, YouTube views and uh, Facebook likes. Right, that doesn't transfer is, uh, you know, to monetary income exactly you can live off really exactly yeah and that's the that's uh, what a lot of people seem to miss these days is to understand that to be a professional means you pay your bills playing yeah drums. yeah and you have to look at a ba- the balance of things youtube and views and social media stuff totally a part of life now totally cool absolutely equal um effort needs to be put into live playing or your band, or like whatever the other aspects of your life are, to really create a well-balanced career. That's one thing that that everyone should think about as you're like a young musician or new in the scene or going to college or whatever, is that most people don't do just one thing until they're really famous for that one thing. Yeah. So until you're John Mayer and you can just, well, he might be a bad example because he got famous really young. Um, <laughs> I don't know, all my friends, like many, many successful musicians I know, they go to school, they write, they produce, they play bass and drums, and they do everything they possibly can, and they book their own band, and they do all this stuff. And they keep doing that because you have to scrap from all these different resources to make a living. And they love all the stuff, it's really cool. I mean, it's a good way to live your life because you're always being challenged in new ways. And eventually, as they get known for the thing that they want to get known for, the other thing is just there isn't time for everything. You know, yeah. so it's like once your band starts to take off, you're, you're maybe you're doing so much that you can't handle all the business stuff, or you can't keep that job at Guitar Center, or you can't do this stuff. So like, everyone I know does a lot of different things. Yeah. And as I see people progress in life, I see them start to drop off or, or lose time for things that are less interesting to them or that they're less passionate about. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, that's an important thing to realize. Because some people are like, I'm going to be a session drummer starting after college. That doesn't happen. That's literally not a thing. Yeah. Not a thing. You're going to have to be a session drummer and play in bands and like help your friend write songs and edit drum parts and do like intern work and do all sorts of random stuff that you might dig, but it's not like you're calling. And yeah. slowly, it leads to where you want to go. Absolutely. You have to outweigh everyone else. That's right. Start dropping like flies. <laughs> All right, so more on uh, because you teach a lot and um, you attended a major, major school as well. So I wanted to ask you now from a student's perspective uh-huh. were there any specific material like books, DVDs, anything that you went through when you were growing up and then later on that kind of because you have a very specific and peculiar way of playing? It always makes me wonder, like. Where did it come this, from? Is this future sound? Is this <laughs> game um, Chafee? What was the inspiration? I've always hated books, which is like, yeah, I've always hated books, which is hard for, that's probably bad news for some teachers to hear, but good news for some students who also hate books. I think it's important to identify how you learn best. And when I have a lesson with someone, a lot of times I ask them right off the bat, how do you learn best? Because I don't want to spend half an hour writing stuff out and then realize that you're not a visual learner and you just yeah. need to hear it once and you're good. So in that case, let's record a video or an audio thing mm-hmm. and you can go home and memorize it and master this thing in a different way. So that I think is the most important part of being a teacher is not trying to like fit a form on everyone. Yeah. You know, because like I've had teachers who've used a lot of books and I've used books. Don't get me wrong. 
but like none of them stick out as having really had a huge effect in my drumming. Right. They were like part of a class or something. Mm -hmm. So for me, I honestly, and I don't watch a lot of YouTube videos either. Um, I, the way I learn best is when someone gives me a small idea and says, is a new idea. Someone who can see my drumming and say, you never ever do anything like this. Try it. And then I'll try it. And they'll be like, maybe they'll be like, here's somewhere it could go. It could go like this. You could do this. Check it out. And we'll go through an exercise that's like, oh wow, what if I like put this group of seven over top of this thing mm -hmm. in this groove or whatever. Yeah. Um, then the ba that's, that's it. That's all I want. I don't want an assigned transcription or uh, examples to go through in a book. From there, I go and apply it to my playing, and I just explore the idea. And it, uh, like some things fall by the wayside, some things really stick though, and that's what becomes a big thing in my playing. Like I can point like all of the like a lot of like the the types of grooves I do now. Like this get 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 boom like. All that continuous flow stuff, yeah. that rooted in like one single moment where I saw someone do one thing and I was like, oh my God, that's so cool. It's just like an inverted paradiddle diddle and then they played a kick beat under it. Yeah. And from there it was like just changing the pattern, doing it in different time signatures, different feels, straight time. And over time it like that turned into a massive part of my playing. So that is how I learned now. I can't say that that's how I've always been. I mean, when you're a beginner drummer, you don't have the vocab to just take an idea yeah. and go like explore it. Yeah. So for me in the beginning, it was more about, I would go see my teacher, same guy for seven years, awesome dude named Wade, who was, I mean, now, I, I mean, at some point, I, I, he kind of passed me off because like I had gotten to a certain level where he, he wasn't going to be able to teach me that much more. Mm -hmm. He was like actually a singer and guitarist. Right who was really good at the drums, multi-instrumentalist guy, and like my hero as a child. So I'd go to him and like we would just do things that we thought were fun. Yeah. And he would challenge me, but he'd find a way to challenge me with like a song that we thought was cool or some beat that was cool. And there was always like a reason to do it. It was like, it was never like, I want you to do pages one through five, even though you don't want to because you're 10 and you're not gonna, yeah. you know? And if you do, you're not gonna care, you're not gonna like it. So he was really good about that, I think. We did a lot of different styles, because I was an open book. It was like, he was like, look at this Prince song, isn't it cool? Let's learn the drum beat. And it was like, look at this Blink-182 song, this Green Day song, whatever it is. So from him, I kind of, I think that's where my appreciation for all music comes from. It's like early on, we just did whatever. And it was like, I, I, and everyone, again, everyone knows differently. Some people need a very like authoritative, you have to do this, and they strive with that. And they thrive with that. Um, for me, that freaks me out. It doesn't make me like the person. It's like, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, it, it was always laid back. Um, I did go through a major phase with Jojo Mayer's Modern Tech, Modern Weapons for the, what is it? Yeah. Secret yeah. Weapons Secret. for the Modern Drummer, part one. <laughs> Obsessed over that DVD for a while. That's like where all my technique know-how comes from. Mm -hmm. Just for like a year. I had this job where I would just sit in like a warming house at an ice rink and do nothing. So I would just do that DVD and do it, try and figure out all the stuff. Right. And that was probably the biggest thing, DVD or book-wise. Because mm -hmm. I think of that often and I refer to it. Right. Yeah. It's a great DVD. So I, good. I did the same. Yeah. Yeah, totally. <laughs> All of that. But yeah, the big, the big idea, figure out how you learn best and like really use that to your advantage. Yeah. But don't say, okay, I learned best by watching videos. Don't ever give me a book. You know, like I've learned yeah. good things from books. I've learned good things from videos. I've learned good things from my teachers. I've learned good things from jazz class, from Latin jazz band, from everything. Like be an open book but also be aware of how you learn things best so you can take whatever info comes from wherever and like be like, cool, what a good idea. If I want to study it further, maybe I should do it in the way that it benefits me most. Also, some things are not best learned in some facets, you know what I mean? Yeah. If you're working on, a, if you really want to get good at like different sticking patterns, going through like stick control 
is probably the best way to do that. Mm. You know, so it's like, A, how do you learn best? But B, what's the best way to learn the thing? Yeah, absolutely. You know, like they say learning jazz. Like the jazz cats I know say, learning jazz is all about playing it and listening to it. So even though you can learn a lot of the independence in a book, at a certain point, you're gonna have to put the book down. I agree. And listen, 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 go to jazz clubs, play as much as you can, jam with friends, even if it's one guy. Yeah. And try to imitate what the great people have done because a lot of that standard jazz stuff is about, you know, like uh, really knowing your stuff. Yeah. And getting the touchdown, the feel. Exactly. Like if you want to emulate Alvin Jones, mm. there's no point in going on Amazon and looking for a book yeah. on Alvin Jones because the guy, he was all about the sound. Exactly. Um, but it, it makes all the sense to what you say and that's a good message for students and teachers. Yeah. I know a lot I tend to use a lot of books, but I tend to use more and more books that are very open form, like a simple mm -hmm. basic book. Totally. That and kind of stuff is like great. Play that like, based room. Yeah, exactly. It's just a pattern. Yeah. And you can do literally hundreds of exercises. With exactly. It. I've used syncopation for actually studying a lot of jazz stuff. <laughs> yeah. When I was trying to when I was developing my vocabulary for jazz. Because it, it's not note for note, but It teaches you to like react to the music. If da boop ba do boop ba boop, you know you're not gonna play ka 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 ka. You'll learn to comp with that pattern. Yeah. So that's yeah, I agree. Cool. The next question would be, how does it look like, or what, what does it look like to your practice session? Like, how do you plan it? Do you sit down and go like, tomorrow I'm going to practice for five hours or? <laughs> is it less random, more random? Um, yeah, it's not. I wish I was that structured, but I'm not. Um, and I guess I don't wish I was that structured because I've been doing the same thing forever. It works. <laughs> you got to be who you're going to be. So, no, I try to get, I mean, I've gone through phases of heavy, heavy practicing. Nowadays, with like just how busy life is, I try and get two hours a day. Mm -hmm. And if I'm preparing for something, I'll try and do two hours in the morning, two hours at night. Like something I'm really like trying to be good at. So yeah, and, and usually my practice session, I have a few topics that I'm focusing on for the bigger, like in, the, in a bigger time frame, like a mm -hmm. year or six yeah, months. Yeah. So maybe for the next year, I have this, usually I have some realization that I suck at something and I'm like, oh my gosh, I, I'm so not free in six eight. I'm going to spend, like, that's going to be a main focus for the next year. So it'll be like 2015, playing 6 eight. That's like one chunk of my practice. And usually there are three, like, bigger topics. I call them umbrella topics. Mm -hmm. And so if one of my big umbrella topics is 6 eight, then I'll, dev I'll, I'll devote a third of my two hours to 6 eight. And that means, what's great is, if you pick a vaguer, a more vague topic like that, I can do six eight swung to 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 cat get straight to to cat to kukum really fast to get to to cat because they all force you to have different vocab learn different things and yeah. push in different ways like yeah. the, some of the stuff in in like a swung slow six eight group is just completely inapplicable to like a quick straight time six eight so that's kind of how I work I usually have three two or three sometimes four things that I'm working on. And one thing I've been experimenting with, which I, I, I guess I can't like scientifically prove is better or worse, but it's worth trying. Um, especially because a, a lot of people, it's, I mean, for most people, it's really hard to focus on one thing for like an hour. Yeah. I can't. So for me, what I've been trying to do is if I have three topics in two hours, instead of going 40 minutes of one, 40 minutes of the next, 40 minutes of the next and done, I'll do 20 minutes of topic A, 20 minutes B, 20 minutes C, and then repeat. And go back to them. Right. Because, and it's, it, honestly, the idea came from this book I was reading about how we learn. And they've done a lot of tests outside of drumming where when you scramble up the things you're learning, you learn them better. You memorize them better. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot about memory in the book. And I think with drums, it's actually a lot about memory because yeah. what you're developing is muscle memory. In the same way that you recognize, like there's one where there's recognizing paintings and who painted what. And if they scramble them all up, you learn them way faster which is really interesting. So with that mentality, I was kind of, I was messing around with that idea. And it makes it a lot easier because 20 minutes is such a manageable chunk. Yeah. If you're like, yo, work on this thing for 20 minutes. It's like, Sweet. by 15 minutes, you're like, okay, I'm ready to move on. But there's only five minutes left. 
Where it's like, if you're like, we're having this for an hour, like, you're going to take a break in the middle, you're going to get distracted, you're going to forget what you're even doing. So, for me, that helps a lot. And that break when you're not doing part A before you come back to part A, your brain's still working. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like, that's the why when you stop playing the video game and leave and then come back, it's really easy when you've been struggling with it for yeah. like a day. It's like because your brain is still connecting things subconsciously when you're done. You know, and it's not something you can control. It's just happening, yeah. which used your advantage, you know. So work on this thing really hard, focused, intent, and then leave it. Do other stuff and come back to it, and things will have pieced together. Yeah, absolutely. So I feel that all the time. Yeah, that helps me a lot. You know, even with my students, uh, you know, if I'm teaching them something that's slightly challenging, even the first lesson, let's play yeah. a rock beat. You know, I teach them the, the, the rock groove for 10 minutes, and then we talk. Yeah. And they were struggling the first 10 minutes, like a lot. They couldn't yeah. play the bass drum on one. It was all over the place. We talk, like, let's try it again. Yeah. Pow. I know. It's there. Yeah, and that's important for teachers to know too. Sometimes just like stop and talk about something totally yeah. random. Yeah. Just take their mind completely somewhere else. That's pretty cool. Um, the other thing, th this is a, a very personal question because I, I've debated myself with this for a while is for you, how do you know, uh, as you progress as a drummer, as a musician, how do you know that you're ready to show what you do to the world? Now with YouTube, it's so easy to do it, and you, you can see that a lot of people are doing it far too early, uh -huh. and it might be dangerous. Right. Some other people you don't even know, and they should be showing what they do. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's, it's, a, it's a weird topic because for the person posting it, there could be a different, a, there's a vast array of reasons they might do it. And for the person watching it, there's a vast, of, uh, there's a vast array of reactions they could have. Mm -hmm. Because you could look at YouTube as an amazing platform to be like, I just started, look at this, this is my first beat, how cool is this? The danger is when someone on the other side is mindless and like rips someone apart. Yeah, for sure. They shouldn't be. Yeah. So... That's a really, it's a really tough question. I don't know if there's a right time, but it's... At least for you, when did you realize, like, you know what? Let's yeah. Go, let's do this. I mean, I started posting stuff on Facebook, I mean, on YouTube in college. I think two videos. Um, and I don't, I really don't have a definite answer to that question because I can think of so many reasons that it's good for you and so many reasons that it could be harmful mm -hmm. because honestly anything that's going to make you practice for an end thing some product result is really good for you yeah. you know so if you're like I'm going to do a YouTube video in three months and I'm going to learn this song till then that YouTube video regardless of the, the product in the end made you work three times as hard and practice all that time and learn this new song and it was really hard and you have all this new vocabulary. So in that sense, it's incredible for you. And to be nervous, to record something and to know what it feels like to be like, okay, now I need to do what I usually do for fun, but I'm really nervous yeah. and it's not as fun and I want it to be good and perfect. That's a really valid. The only downside is the people trolling and, and leaving yeah, negative absolutely. comments. So. I don't know, maybe the answer is to just not have, turn comments off, you know, if, if you're like, because there's, yeah. the, there's the other side of it where it's like, a lot of times I meet people and they're like, I'm not ready to do the drum off, I'm going to do it in a couple of years, and mm -hmm. it's like, well, you have nothing to lose, like, just go do it, you'll learn a lot on the way, it'll push you, it'll be totally positive, you'll meet new people, who cares if you don't win, no one ever wins their first year, literally in the history of the thing, no one has ever won their first year. So it's like, no, just go do it. The amount you learn doing it is, you'll never learn the same things by just continuing practicing for it, you know? Mm -hmm. So I don't have like a good yes or no, this is when you should, but there are a lot of positives to doing something where that is pushing you in any way. Making you nervous, like making you practice for something, that stuff's good. Yeah. And if you're afraid of how people are gonna react, don't let them react. Turn comments off. Who cares? Yeah, well, it's, just, it's like, why are you doing it? For the validation that people think it's really cool? Or see it as a different way. See if like, okay, this is a personal challenge. It's going to make me better. This is an important step in my step in drumming, in my, in my journey in drumming, because 
<clears throat> it's kind of simulating a session or a video shoot mm -hmm. or something that I want to do in the future. So if you look at it that way, I think it's really positive. Yeah. And if you spread positive vibes out there and you, because a lot of times if you're a very positive person, you end up in a fairly positive community, you know? So yeah, just, you know, spread the good vibes and they'll come back around. Yeah, for sure. My question <laughs> was, was, like I said, it was very personal because for me, I didn't grow up, grow up with YouTube. So for me, that was like very daunting. The idea yeah. of... You never you upload it and you never know like you might yeah. get thirty views you guys you might get thirty thousand because yeah. you suck yeah yeah <laughs> and that was always for me uh, when YouTube appeared and and social media started becoming a thing and very important and then yeah, I have the voice at the back of my head saying but you should you know because it, right. it's important everyone else is yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah so but you it, it took me a while yeah I'm not gonna lie to to upload a video on YouTube with me playing yeah. And many times I would upload a video, wait for the reaction, take it down. Uh, yeah. You know, like, it was pointless, take it down. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so, I, and I know a lot of people question themselves, even playing live, even starting doing some recording sessions, they, like we were talking about people who skip steps, this is the, the other way around, they, these people don't take the step. Yeah. They, they are very scared of failing and, yeah. and public reaction. It can be yeah. cruel, like you said, because a lot of people, and these days it's so easy to be mean. Yeah, totally. Keyboard warriors are everywhere, and yeah. and it's hard for someone who's 15, 16, 17 yeah. to deal with that. It's really yeah. hard. It's a very sensitive period yeah. of your life. I look at it as more of a professional thing than a personal thing. Don't do it for, don't do it to get 100% thumbs up, you know, who gives yeah. you crap. Turn that off. If, if, if that scares you out of doing it, just turn it off and do it so that when someone in your high school is looking for a drummer, you can be like, yeah, cool, yeah. here, I'll text you the link so you can see me drum. Done. Yeah. You know, like it's really valuable to have. And honestly, the first place anyone looks when anyone hears about anything is YouTube. Mm -hmm. So that's where, like it is very valuable to have content on it that you're proud of. Yeah. So yeah, if you look at it that way, don't get attached to what other people say. Don't even get emotionally attached to what it is yourself. Be like, okay, that was my best. And if I want to show the world my best, that's it. You know, it wasn't, maybe it wasn't perfect, maybe it was, but that's my best right now. I mean, I'm trying to do one in six months and make it even better. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. If you look at it that way, I think it's healthy. But it scares the hell out of me too. <laughs> yeah, it, it is, can be very overwhelming. Yeah, totally. The totally. amount of, it, it's the, it, for me, it, it, and I know for a lot of people, it's not even knowing because when you're playing live and you have a thousand people in front of you, it's scary, but it's going to be a thousand people in front of you in five minutes. Yeah. It doesn't change. <laughs> yeah. So until you finish that gig, it's going to be, hopefully, a thousand people yeah. in front of you, so you get used to it. Yeah. You put it out there, you don't know. It's going to be a million, it's going to be one. Yeah. It's very, it's that unknown of Great unknown. what the exposure is going to be. The great unknown is always scary. Sure, yeah. Anyhow. All right, so about you, I wanted to know like what are your future plans for next year? I know you're doing a drum camp in Germany, for example, so mm -hmm. if you want to talk about that and what totally. you have in planned. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's, strangely enough, for the first time, I have like almost all of next year planned right now. It just kind of happened. Um, it, yeah, next year, let's see. The bigger goal that I'm trying to do is like kind of balance out my teaching and my playing in bands, playing music with people kind of thing. Yeah. Um, because I, I wouldn't be happy with just one of them, honestly. Mm -hmm. So I do have a little bit of a fear of be kind of being like pigeonholing myself as I'm like this online teacher clinic guy and that's it. Not that I, I think that's awesome when people want that, yeah. but it's not, that's not the reason I started playing drums. I started playing drums because I love playing music. Mm -hmm. And I still play drums because I love playing music with people. I love what I do. I love teaching. But it's really essential for me to play in bands. And I think that's why I'm, I have any value as a, as a teacher is because of my experiences. Yeah. So for me, I'm trying to kind of like push the bands a little more. I'm starting a new group that's the more improvised music. 
So what I'd like to do is like kind of balance out the clinic tours I'm doing with band tours. Mm -hmm. That's a very, this is a very personal subject, but that's an inside look at like what my goal is for the upcoming years. Cool. Because yes, I'm, I'm doing a uh, camp in uh, the Common Thread Clinic Tour is doing a drum camp in February. Right. That's currently sold out. In Germany in March, I'm doing a four day drum camp that has, I think, two spaces left. In January, I'm going to Barcelona and, Janu and France for a couple days to do a drum event there. Um, later in the year, I'm doing a, a drum camp in France at Ecole du Groove with Julian O'Connor. Um, that'll be all in French, so I'm very excited about that because cool. I've been practicing. And then filling in the gaps, there will be band tours with Dave McKay. Um, Drew of the, that's for sure. Drew of the Drew, I don't know when we're touring, but we will be at some point next year. Um, and this new group I'm starting is going to be playing in New York more mm -hmm. um, and maybe traveling more. But yeah, that's like my big balancing act right now. Cool. Because, and the reason that it, I've kind of realized it's out of whack is that I got such a head start in the drum, on the drumming community side mm -hmm. from the drum off. Yeah. And I launched my website and have done a lot of clinic tours and I've loved every second of it. But that just got a head start, you know. I'm trying to just kind of catch the, the rest of the stuff up. Um, and it'll get there. I have yeah. full faith. It's just the bands are quite young. And th that stuff takes time, you know. So I'm just trying to be patient and kind of push everything along. Cool. Yeah. Good and I'm stuff. going to Bali with my girlfriend and friends uh, next year. There you August. go. <laughs> so you live life. That's my little vacay for next year. <laughs> cool, man. Yeah. Uh, my last question is again bringing the whole thing back home is what do you see as the future of music education I know we were just talking about mm -hmm. bands but yeah um I was just thinking about that actually today um, it's interesting to think about because there are so many alternative places to learn online yeah um, there are so many websites like mine you know and Mike Johnston's, Dromeo, uh, Berkeley Online, all sorts of online stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious to see kind of what that creates because, I, yeah, it's just, I, it's hard to know how valuable is it to have a teacher in the room. I think it's valuable. And I think the most important thing you can get from an educational facility is the people you're around, the yeah. network, the people you're going to work with, real life interaction. Um, I still think and don't think that's going to change. I think it's the most important thing, you know, yeah. even working with a teacher one-on-one -on -one and learning, like just having that sort of instilled in you that this is a person who is <clears throat> an authority in the subject. I chose to work with them. I respect them. I'm going to treat them in a certain way. Yeah. Like this, they're all very simple life lessons that you just don't get online, you know? And I think the level of drumming is going to keep increasing because the, of the amount of content that's available. And it's a, a mix of content from educational places like, like here, like anything on a lesson online, you know, that stuff, and performances. You can watch a lot of drummers do a lot of crazy things online. Yeah. And if you look at it long enough and watch it enough times and try it enough times you'll be able to figure it out so I think it's gonna keep progressing and people are gonna keep doing crazier things but I don't know I don't think it should all come from one place I would not recommend anyone learning solely online right now mm -hmm. I'd say even if you're a member of my site have a private lesson teacher sure that you can take the videos to yeah. and be like yeah I can't figure this out or like, hey, I'm doing it, but like, what could I do next? Because maybe I end the series there, you know? Yeah. So I think a combination is essential. And I feel like more and more, my answer to everything is balance. You it's know? a good answer. Yeah. Balance of like sitting one-on-one -on -one with someone and having them watch you play. Because all it takes is someone being like, you know, you never really like do this. And then, poof, world opened. Where a computer can't do that. Or hey, your hi-hat's exactly. just annoyingly loud. You know? That's Feedback. it. Never forget for the rest of your life. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it's a balance. Learn online, have a lesson teacher. If you're, if you're going to school for it, like cherish it and get the most out of it. Saddest thing is when someone goes to 
music school or they take lessons for years and then they tell me, yeah, I didn't really, you know, they say, yeah, I did like what you do at college when I was at college. I didn't, I didn't practice enough and now I regret it. It's like, that's dumb. That's not what you do at college. Like you're paying, well, depends where you live. If you're in the States, you're paying tens of thousands of dollars yeah. to go to college. You're paying like maybe thousands a day to be there. So you're going to do what with that time, you know? Yeah. So I don't know. It's a balance. That, that's my answer. For sure. Yeah. No, I, th I, I totally agree with you. Just to, to share my, my point of view, I think that um, the, the biggest flaw at the moment, it might be fixed in the future, I don't know, is the lack of feedback. Yeah. It, it is easy nowadays to have a, a chat room while you're broadcasting live. Sure, we all, like, Drumio does that, Mike Johnson does that. Yeah. But a lot of people don't ask questions. It's like coming to a drum clinic. You always have those guys that, at the end, they come to you like, you know what, I have 10 questions for you. And like, yeah. Dude, it's over. Yeah. Uh, Where were you in the Q&A? Exactly. <laughs> it's the same thing online, I believe. Um, yeah. And there's a lot of people asking questions. So he kind of lacks feedback. Like you are saying, like, mm -hmm. your hi-hat is too loud. That's, that's priceless feedback. Yeah. When I heard those things from my private teachers, and I watch a lot of online lessons, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit of, a, of an addicted to <laughs> drum your stuff. They, they launch those lessons. Uh, I go to your website, um, Mike Johnson's. You know, I like it, but I always went back to, yeah, okay, I'm playing this, but uh, maybe I should ask my teachers, does this sound right yeah. for me? Totally. Does this make sense, or am I sounding like JP Bouvier now? Right. Because that's not... You know, it, the goal. I wished, but <laughs> but it's not the goal because I'm not going to do it. So yeah. might as well not even try it. Um, but uh, but yeah, I think it's the feedback, and I really hope that the industry kind of finds a way, honestly, to yeah. to close that gap. Yeah, well, sharing the information, but also yeah, and at the, it. at the moment, um, I think people should pay attention to what Mike Johnson's doing because yes, he was the first one to live stream and open, like chat room and all that stuff, but that's his goal now. Yeah. And I know because he's a good friend and I'm not afraid to push his website because there's room for everyone. Sure. Um, and that's what he's trying to do. He, he's recognized the same problem and he's trying to make it more of a course where you are held accountable online. You have to submit things. You have to, you get feedback and it is making like the best drummer for you. You know, it's tailored to mm -hmm. you. Even yes. though it's it's a there is a wealth of information for everyone to access, you know. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's gotta be someone kind of trailblazing that. And I think right now it's Mike Johnston. Um, so I think he'd he'd be someone to I, I would just encourage people to look at him and if that's your mission in life online, don't compete just like pay attention and, and and like learn you know the learn a lesson from what he's trying to do you know yeah i read something that he wants to become a hologram so yeah there you go that's the next step uh, and I, I actually <laughs> think he's serious he is i know <laughs> and, that and for I, sure <laughs> and I, I love it yeah i love it and uh, it makes me um i'm very curious about it uh -huh. how it would work because yeah. I'm a total noob when it comes to technology, so people go like holograms. Oh my god! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, but if it happens, I'm yeah. booking a cleaning with him. Yeah. You like <laughs> but like, from California. <laughs> yeah. There you go. There you go. Well, man, that's uh, those are my questions for you, and I really awesome. appreciate your time, and I hope we you have fun this afternoon with your master class here. Yeah. Everything's ready. We I will have fun. This is here. You're here. There will be people here. I get to play some new tracks. Sweet. Never world debut. New there we go. Here in Leeds. So yeah, I'm very excited. It's always fun to come. Cool man. So thanks for having me. You're very welcome. Thank you. Hell yeah.